Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and a privilege to be with you. I hope that I'm coming through loud and clear, especially for our hardworking interpreters. Okay. Uh, can the colleagues in the, uh, the translators hear me loud and clear? And I promise I will try to speak not too fast, uh, which, for which I'm sometimes notorious. Uh, so I hope that we can go on. Well, it's really an honor and uh, privilege to be with you today. And I would like to thank European Law Academy, uh, Professor Jovic and her team for inviting me and having me over uh, to be with you. So whenever I give a presentation on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I like to remind myself and the participants, no matter if I'm talking to the legal practitioners, people who have expertise in the field of rights of persons with disabilities, uh, academici academicians, uh, future lawyers, students of law, disability activists, persons with disability, decision makers at local or national level, I always like to say that human rights are universal and indivisible. They belong to each human being. So, of course, they belong to persons with disabilities. But for a really long period of time, persons with disabilities were the invisible citizens. They were segregated, they were marginalized, they were exposed to discrimination. Over the past few de decades, through tireless efforts of persons with disabilities themselves, their movement worldwide and at national levels, the situation has changed. So in December 2006, after five years of negotiations, United Nations General Assembly unanimously adopted Convention on the <coughs> Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the optional protocol to it. That was the first human rights treaty in the new millennium. And it was also one of the fastest growing human rights treaties. Uh, it was opened for signature ratification end of March 2007, and it became the uh, treaty that attracted the largest number of signatures in one day. More than 70 UN member states signed it, and we got the first ratification that date, it was Jamaica. So from end of March 2007 until the beginning of May 2008, so a little bit more than 13 months, there were 20 ratifications, so 20 state parties, <coughs> convention and the optional protocol to it entered in force. In the meantime, uh, last year uh, we have celebrated the 10th anniversary of entry of the convention in force and it has gotten really close to the universal ratification. We have 177 state parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities at this moment. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, we have 175 uh, United Nations member states. Uh, also, as a state party, we have State of Palestine with its special status in the UN. And for the very first time, it was a real precedent in international public law. We have international regional organization, European Union becoming a state party. So we have both, all member states of the EU are parties to the convention, and the EU itself is party to the convention. It was rather interesting at one point, now it is just a uh, you know, theoretical uh, issue, but at one point uh, we had EU as state party to the convention and a number of EU member states who still have not ratified the convention. So uh, if I remember correctly, some of the states that ratified the convention after EU did it were, for example, Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, I believe, uh, Estonia, uh, Finland, Netherlands, Ireland was the last of few member states who became state party to the convention last year. So I remember a seminar in Bulgaria, the office of ombudsperson of that country organized it and I had the privilege to speak there back in 2011-2012 and there was a very interesting issue. What happens in EU member states that still have not ratified at that point convention? Do you apply? What do you apply? And at that point, it was said, now it's something that only the uh, academicians will look at it from the theoretical, not the practical point of view. They said at that point in time, back in 2011-12, 
Okay, if uh, an issue is an exclusive competence of EU or is shared competence between member states in EU, then convention applies, even if the state party has not ratified the convention. But if it's an exclusive competence of member state, then it doesn't apply. So that was quite a tricky situation. To my knowledge, I haven't really heard of any practical cases, and now it's an obsolete historical question, but I felt it may be interesting for me to share with you. Optional protocol, which provides for the possibility of submitting individual communications and initiating inquiry into grave systematic violations of the convention, has been ratified or acceded to by a smaller number of states, 94. As for the convention, basically all countries in Europe have ratified it. Uh, there are some uh, countries in Central Asia, uh, primarily some former Soviet republics that have not been state parties to it, some countries in Africa, some smaller island states, and US of A, uh, there are the countries that still are not state parties to the convention, and naturally, uh, Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, international community continues uh, making an appeal for universal ratification of the convention, and we will see how that will work out in practice. So we can go to the next slide. Now the purpose of the convention. Going back to that idea of human rights being universal, indivisible, and belonging to each human being. The purpose of convention in Article 1, it says, is to promote, protect, and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with disabilities and foster respect for their inherent dignity. So this convention marks a clear moving away from the medical model of approach to disability to the new model. While the convention has been negotiated in New York from 2001 until 2006, people were talking about social model of approach to disability. Over the last 10 years, while the convention has been uh, implemented, a new concept came. Uh, it's a human rights, uh, an approach to disability based on human rights. Though for me personally, even though some of my dear friends and colleagues in the committee see it differently, see it as separate uh, models, well, for me, you know, human rights model is a natural uh, building up on the basis of social model because social model says we have disability, which happens in interaction between persons with impairments and the barriers those persons face uh, around them. And, of course, one of the most important consequences of that is that persons with disabilities cannot enjoy the human rights on an equal basis with others. So, when we talk about the situation of persons with disabilities, it's a human rights issue. So that is the uh, new concept which has been very strongly promoted by the Convention and by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Next slide, please. Convention is based on a number of principles put forth in Article 2. Respect for inherent dignity, individual autonomy, including freedom to make one's own choices, and dependence of persons with disabilities. Non-discrimination, full and effective participation and inclusion in society. Respect for difference and acceptance of persons with disabilities as part of human diversity and humanity. Equality of opportunity, accessibility, equality between men and women. A respect for the evolving capacities of children with disabilities and respect for the right of children with disabilities to preserve their identity. At first, I have to say, when I was, even while I was in New York as part of my country's uh, delegation that was negotiating, I was a bit surprised what we are talking about. Uh, this last part, respect for evolving capacities and preserving uh, the identity, was put forth by World Federa Deaf Federation. And then, I understood, of course, supported by other uh, organizations of persons with disabilities in the International Disability Caucus. And then I remember that back in 1980s, 1990s, children with disability, deaf children uh, were forced uh, to use, uh, to try to develop uh, speech. Uh, and they were prohibited to use sign language, which is their natural language. So that was uh, the reason why the World Federation of Deaf has put forth this uh, as one of the basic principles in the convention. And really, convention does promote sign language very strongly, and I'm very happy to see that we do have some uh, 
interpreters and also the users of sign language with us here. So we can go to the next slide, please. Convention reaffirms human rights which already belong to people with disabilities. Right to life in Article 10. Protection in various situations of risk. Armed conflicts, natural disasters. So, you know, looking at the uh, level of Europe, we have hotline 112. Is it accessible for all, for all persons with disabilities, especially for deaf persons? Are the information about uh, evacuation procedures understandable to persons with intellectual disabilities? What are the measures which states take to make sure that no person with disability is left behind in a situation of risk? We've got the Sendai protocol uh, on disaster risk management later on, and that is something which committee very much insists in our, in our dialogues with state parties. Then, Article 12, equal recognition before the law, so we talk about the legal capacity. And that was one of the most groundbreaking and greatest changes uh, of paradigm, because many years ago, when I was a student of the first year of law studies, I was studying Roman law. And it was sort of built into our, you know, for a lawyer's uh, terms of reference, it was built into our, you know, way of thinking that if a person, due to some type of impairment, especially if it's intellectual or psychosocial condition, uh, in his or her best interest, he's put under guardianship. And then somebody else makes decisions for him or her. And here convention makes a big shift and says, no, everybody has the full legal, should have the full legal capacity, and everybody should, uh, if required, they will be receiving additional uh, support for, uh, additional support for, uh, in exercising that legal capacity. Uh, then, Article uh, 13, access to justice. Again, if person is under guardianship, he or she cannot start proceedings then, of course, we have to have procedural accommodations. Deaf persons need to have uh, sign language interpretation if they are parties to the, uh, some proceedings. Blind persons have to receive information in uh, electronic format or braille print. Uh, additional support should be provided to persons with intellectual disabilities if necessary. Article 14, liberty. Uh, nobody should be deprived of their liberty on basis of disability. And committee had a rather interesting individual communication <coughs> case in Australia uh, several years ago. Uh, we had a young individual with intellectual um, psychosocial combined disabilities who allegedly committed quite a disgusting crime of sexual uh, harassment and violence against a minor. He was sent to court court declared him unfit to stand trial because of his condition. So he was placed in a psychiatric institution. However, the time that individual spent in psychiatric institution was longer than the maximal prison sentence. If he were, if he were non-disabled, individual committed the same crime, was found guilty in a trial, uh, and was sentenced to prison, it would be maybe 12 years of prison maximum sentence. That individual spent 15 years in an institution, and then after he has been released from the institution, he also had additional security measures imposed on him that wouldn't have been imposed on uh, an individual uh, who doesn't have disability and who committed the same type of offense. So it was very clearly uh, differential uh, discriminatory treatment. Article 15, freedom from torture, other degrading and inhuman treatment and punishment. Convention prohibits explicitly the medical experimentation without free informed consent of person with disability. Also, there we have the situation of persons in special psychiatric institutions in net cage beds. That is definitely a form of torture. Uh, then, of course, personal integrity here, the issue of uh, forced sterilization especially against women and girls with disabilities, is important. Then, nationality and liberty of movement in Article 18. And in some of the countries, uh, some of the countries uh, that have a lot of migrants, uh, which are traditionally 
uh, immigrant countries like Australia or Canada, they have provisions that prevent persons with some types of impairment from applying for uh, citizenship of those countries. Uh, so, then we can go on. Uh, freedom of expression and opinion, Article 21, that is uh, access to information, that is what I already mentioned, sign language interpretation for deaf persons, uh, electronic formats, braille print for blind persons, and persons with intellectual disabilities, easy to understand, plain language uh, documents. And actually in committee, we have a colleague who serves since 2017, he's individual with intellectual disability. And he was really facing challenges how to participate on an equal basis with others, because committee, as a committee of many lawyers, uses the legalistic jargon, which is sometimes very complex and challenging for even for layman who doesn't know law to follow it. So uh, there was a need to get translation of those documents, at least basic ones for him into plain language, easy read format. So committee had to appeal to private donors and also some of the state parties made donations which enabled our colleagues to make uh, Fair, fair and equal participation in the committee and also, for example, when in closed sessions, committees reviewing the individual communications, we always assign one of us as rapporteur and then he or she has to present it to the other committee members and uh, since 2017, we made it practice to make that in plain language, those presentations. So, Article 22, right to privacy. Article 23, right to marriage and family life. There we have challenge for mm, persons under guardianship to marry. And also sometimes uh, children with disabilities are separated from their families. Uh, or also uh, persons with disabilities who are parents are get separated from their children because they are deemed that they are unfit to be good parents. So Article 24, right to education and committing, it's a general comment. Number four expanded that to right to inclusive education, and that was uh, one general comment which made quite a splash, and there was a lot of debates about it. Then Article uh, 25, health care, uh, both access to mainstream health care. Unfortunately, many of the hospitals are not physically accessible to persons with restricted mobility, and I have to say I was always absolutely amazed at the fact that in some countries you have like a rehabilitation center spa which is on stairs and it is supposed even if you're not a person with disability uh, you send somebody who had accident and broke his uh, leg and he or she has to walk up and down the stairs I don't know if the designers of those rehabilitation centers thought it would be good physical exercise for the quote-unquote patients to do it so it's completely ridiculous then, of course, the issue of uh, deaf individuals uh, being able to communicate with their doctors. Uh, there is a need to use the sign language, and that's a challenge. Then, one thing which is, mm, which I was actually in my country, and I've heard it cases in other countries, for example, how a person with intellectual disability or with psychosocial disability goes to the dentist. Uh, the, one of the basic stomatological treatments which we take for granted, how do you do it? Or how do you find, actually, from my point of view, how do you find a dentist's uh, uh, office that is uh, barrier-free so I can enter it with my wheelchair? So those are some of the challenges. Uh, then, of course, uh, adequate standard of living uh, and social protection. Uh, very often, the additional costs of disability, unfortunately, are not met. And in cases of austerity measures and all across Europe, uh, we were coming across that. Persons with disabilities were facing challenges with that. Participation in political life and conduct of public affairs. First of all, if a person is under guardianship, he or she cannot uh, take part in the political life. We did have uh, several uh, individual communications in that respect. For example, one of the early ones was against Hungary, where six individuals with intellectual disabilities were put under guardianship, so they were not allowed to vote. So, and the committee found that it, this is contrary to the 
Article 29 of the Convention. And I'm sure that there will be mentions of that in similar cases in the jurisprudence of European Court of Human Rights. Then uh, we do have also participation in political, yeah. I actually, when I'm talking about that, I would like to refer you to look at the Organization for European Security and Cooperation, OESC. They did one project over the last two years, very detailed, about how to promote political participation of persons with disabilities. Even if a person has a legal capacity and can vote, many of the voting places are not accessible. Information is not accessible for persons uh, with sensory impairments. Persons with intellectual uh, disabilities, even if they are not under guardianship, they need to get in plain text uh, uh, information about the programs of the parties and the process of how to vote. And I was actually happy to see that um, annual EDF were conducting a campaign promoting the participation of citizens across the Europe to uh, exercise that right. And I think I read it on the internet that Germany has recently, the Constitutional Court, made a good ruling about enabling citizens of Germany with disabilities that were under guardianship and had restricted uh, right to vote that they will be able to take part in the upcoming uh, European elections, which is good development. Then participation in culture, sports, leisure activities, tourism. And whenever we had a dialogue with the state party, I always would ask the delegation to sort of ease it up towards the end of the dialogue because we asked them a lot of hard questions. I would, you always say, well, listen, uh, could you please give us a bit of more information about accessible tourism in your beautiful country so we will be able to come and uh, visit you. So that was nice. And actually, Council of Europe uh, did back in 2013 uh, a study on access to sports, culture, recreation, tourism for persons with disabilities. I had the privilege of being the uh, consultant on that project in 2014. They published it, and I think the electronic version can be found at the website of Council of Europe, so I recommend it to you. <clears throat> and in all those articles, so we have provisions on the measures which state parties have to take to enable persons with disabilities to enjoy those rights. We can go to the next slide, please. Well, I always like to say that Articles 4 on general obligations and 5 on equality and non-discrimination constitute the core of the Convention. State parties undertake to ensure and promote full realization of fundamental freedoms and human rights for all persons with disabilities without any discrimination on the basis of disability. We can go to the next slide. What is important is mainstreaming of disability issues into general policies. Of course, that doesn't uh, say that there is no need. There is a need also for twin-track approach. All general policies which address issues that are relevant to persons with disabilities have to have that accessibility, full inclusion clause. And then we have to have specific strategies for persons with disabilities. Training of professional staff working with persons with disabilities on rights of those persons. And I was happy to see that we have different professionals from different countries here today. And that's this is actually an excellent example of how that general obligation is implemented. And then something very important. Article 4, paragraph 3, and that's people coming from disability movement know it by heart, nothing about us without us, the motto of international and national disability movements. So there is a need to consult persons with disabilities through their representative organizations in development of policies, legislations, and in the implementation of the convention. And recently, committee did adopt uh, general comment number seven that covered that issue. We can go to the next slide, please. Now we have something which is a bit of dichotomy and it's sort of tradition in international public law. Civil political rights of persons with disabilities have to be implemented immediately. Social, economic, cultural rights will be implemented progressively and gradually. 
with the maximal use of available resources. But that is a bit tricky. Uh, those, there is that border is not so clear. For example, uh, uh, if we don't have accessibility, our freedom of movement, which is one of the basic human rights, is restricted. But we are aware that it cannot be, not all the barriers can be removed overnight. It takes time and takes resources. On the other hand, uh, right to education, that right is economic, social, cultural right. But still, it is illegal to say in law and education that school can reject the student on grounds of his disability or her disability. That's a direct discrimination on the basis of disability, and that's something is, that is not acceptable, regardless of the available resources. <laughs> and also, uh, we had the cases of austerity measures. And in such cases, uh, a council, uh, Committee for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights says that even if there are some retrogressions in the rights, they have to be proportionate. And they cannot discriminatorily affect any groups. And it was <coughs> pointed out that, in fact, persons with disabilities are often are among those groups that are most affected. And committee, in its first inquiry into alleged grave and systematic violations of the Convention against the UK, found that the uh, social welfare reform in the UK was actually uh, targeting disproportionately persons with disabilities, and that that was a violation of a number of provisions of the Convention, especially Articles 19, uh, 27, and 28. Of course, it's important to develop, promote research, and apply universal design. So all the newly produced goods, objects, infrastructure, ICT services, all of them are made accessible. If you forget to do that, then something that could be a wonderful tool to make a society more equal will actually create more barriers and more differences and segregations. Next slide, please. State parties in Article 5, Clause 1 says, recognize that all persons are equal before and under the law, are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection and equal benefit of the law. And they prohibit all discrimination on the basis of disability and guarantee effective and equal legal remedies against protection against discrimination on all grounds. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so, any form of discrimination, direct, indirect, denial of reasonable accommodation to all persons with disabilities. And I was happy to hear that there will be more talk about it, especially about the multiple intersectional discrimination, uh, which persons with dis <laughs> some groups of persons with disabilities face, uh, especially committee dealt with the issue of women and girls with disabilities, and I know that one of the colleagues will be talking more about it today or tomorrow. So. Now when we talk, uh, and the Convention does actually specific um, address the situation of women with disabilities and children with disabilities. When we talk about the reasonable accommodation, I will give you a few, ex few examples. Uh, reasonable accommodation are individualized measures that are taken to enable one person with disability to enjoy his or her rights on an equal basis with others. We usually go for in the field of accessibility. And that's not so uncommon. Uh, but it can affect both economic, social, cultural, or rights. For example, we have a lecturer who gives lectures at university. And we have a blind student. Blind student uh, is not able to take notes. So he goes to the professor and asks if he or she can uh, audio tape uh, audio record the lectures, and it would be reasonable accommodation for the professor to allow it. It affects accessibility, but uh, accessibility in a systemic way for that one would be that the textbook of that professor is accessible in electronic format for anybody, any blind individual who wants to use it, so that is the difference. Or, 
another case which actually happened in my home country. Uh, there was one of the municipalities in our capital city, and a friend and colleague of mine who uh, walks with crutches went to the building. The building was partially accessible. One wing had elevators, uh, second wing, wing uh, had ramp at the entrance, but no elevators to the second floor. And the office that was in charge of tax revenues was in that part of the building. My colleague wanted to uh, report her income for that year, so municipality can calculate her municipal taxes, and she can pay them. And they said, well, madam, uh, the office is at the second floor. And she's like, I cannot climb with own crutches for 24 steps. Can't you ask somebody to come out from the office to the uh, lobby, and, to, and I will give him or her all the data necessary so we can calculate my uh, tax, uh, uh, taxes for this year. And they said, no, no, no. We have a regulation uh, which, in order to prevent uh, uh, corruption, says that all transactions uh, related, official transactions related to tax uh, calculation have to be taken only in the office. And my colleague, that was back in 2006. It was just a few months after Serbia adopted law on prevention of discrimination against persons with disabilities. And my friend evoked Article 11, which says that all public procedures have to be conducted in a manner that is accessible to persons with disabilities and is not discriminatory. <coughs> so she said, well, if you don't send, they were like, well, why don't you authorize somebody to go to the second floor uh, to the office? And she's like, well, how much income per year I make, it's just between me and the state. I don't want to hire a third person to know what my income is. I just want to, as a loyal citizen, I want to pay my taxes, but I want to do it as a private matter between myself and the state. So unless you get some of the uh, clerks from the office downstairs, I will sue you. And within half an hour, the clerk was down in the lobby, and my friend did have her tax income uh, filled out. So that was an example. Later on, they did reconstruct the building, and they made it a fully accessible. So and that was an example. And the last example of reasonable accommodation comes from Africa. There was a company that hired an individual with restricted mobility to work, and that is really good. Uh, that individual was driving by car uh, to the company. A uh, company had a private parking space. So we don't talk about public um, parking space where they would have to make accessibility standards. It's just private. And all the parking spaces next to the entrance were reserved for the executives and directors of the company. So that individual came and said, listen, it would be reasonable accommodation for me to allow me to park my car next to the entrance. I don't have to walk because she was moving with the assistance of crutches. I don't have to walk. Uh, 200 meters across the parking lot, I could go just a few steps, a few meters uh, to the building. And they said, no, 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 this is just reserved for the uh, executives and directors. And I think that was quite a shame. And that was a few years ago. I haven't received feedback on what happened. I know that the individual wanted to <coughs> press legal charges, but I don't know if that in particular country in Africa there was an illegal framework for combating that type of discrimination. So. I hope that I will receive at some point more information about that case, but it's very interesting. The convention, of course, specifically addresses it, uh, some disability-specific issues. Accessibility, and my dear colleague and friend, the inaugural uh, chairperson of the committee, uh, Mr. Al Tarwani from Jordan, said that accessibility is backbone of the convention. Then, personal mobility, and support services, uh, living independently and being included in the community. Well, uh, accessibility, we had general comment number two, uh, in the, uh, living independently and being included in the community, we had general comment number five, and my colleague from Denmark did call that article 19 soul of the convention, and of course he was very right about it. So, then practically, of course, if I don't live in an accessible ho uh, house back home. If I don't have accessible transport organized by local uh, organization of persons with disabilities in my hometown, Belgrade, if I did not have the uh, support services at Belgrade Airport, Munich Airport as a transit, Luxembourg Airport, 
if I did not have the accessible uh, car waiting for me at the Luxembourg airport, if I did not have the uh, accessible hotel across in Vienna House, and if this building wasn't accessible, I wouldn't be here with you today. So this is a demonstration of how important unrestricted chain of uh, mobility is. Also, personal mobility, if I didn't have my wheelchair, again, I wouldn't be able to give you a lecture here today. And last but certainly not least, if I did not have my personal assistants with me to assist me to get dressed in the morning, transfer me to the wheelchair, uh, help me move across here, again, I wouldn't be with you. So these three articles are really of fundamental uh, importance for persons with disabilities to be able to participate equally. We can go to the next slide. Well, now, article 34 to 39. Uh, are about setting up and functioning of the committee. We have 18 independent experts, high moral integrity, uh, knowledge of disability rights, and of course state parties at the conference select them and they have to take part into account uh, equal geographic distribution, a representation of all legal systems of all different cultures, gender balance, and also possible different types of impairment. So, last year we had elections for the committee, and now we have a new uh, committee with number of the old number of newly elected members. And since this year we have experts coming from Lithuania, Hungary, Switzerland, Russian Federation, Tunisia, Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya. Saudi Arabia, <coughs> Thailand, Republic of Korea, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Mexico, and Brazil. So we have relatively fair geographical distribution. From 2017 until the end of 2018, we had gender disbalance. We had only one woman on the committee, Professor Teresa Degner, who was chairing us. Uh, but so to say, blessing in disguise for that one was uh, that many of us because we didn't want to be a closed boys club. Uh, remaining 17 male members of the committee uh, did make a promise when five colleagues, uh, experts, uh, female experts from UK, Turkey, uh, Guatemala, uh, uh, Chile, uh, were leave and Spain were leaving the committee in 2016, we made a promise to them and said, listen, we will be asking questions about women and girls with disabilities. And we really did that a lot from 2017 until 2018. In 2019, we have again six, six uh, amazing women on the committee. We have female colleagues from Australia, from Mexico, from Brazil, from Indonesia, from Ghana, and uh, from uh, yeah, Republic of Korea. Uh, in terms of different impairments, uh, we have uh, five wheelchair users in the committee. We have I think five or six persons with visual impairments. We have one deaf person, one person hard of hearing, one colleague with intellectual disability. And out of 18 members, 17 are persons with disabilities. We have one colleague who doesn't have disability but we worked with disability movement in his country for a number of years. So that is the composition of the committee. What does the committee do? Well. First of all, it reviews the reports of the state parties, which should give us information how convention is being implemented. We can go to the next slide, please. And also, we have the optional protocol, which provides for possibility of submission of complaints in case of violation. Uh, once all national legal remedies are exhausted, and also a uh, possibility of investigating serious grave and systematic violations of provisions of the Convention. Next slide, please. <coughs> so, so far, the committee has reviewed 81 initial state party reports. EU presented its report, and also quite a lot of EU member states. I will hopefully be able to give it in chronological order, the ones who did it so far. We had Spain, we had Hungary, we had Austria, we had Sweden, we had Belgium, we had Denmark, we had Czech Republic, we had Croatia, we had Germany, we had Italy, we had Portugal, we had Slovakia, we had Lithuania, we had Latvia, Cyprus, Luxembourg, 
UK that was part of EU at that uh, point. Uh, we had Poland, we had Malta, and we had Bulgaria so far. Since 2017, there were 21 state parties have received uh, questions under simplified procedure for the second and third combined periodic reports. And in March, April this year, Spain was the first country that presented its uh, second periodic report. So that was a very important number of other EU member states also received uh, questions under that simplified procedure. Sweden, Austria, Hungary, uh, Germany, I believe also Denmark, Czech Republic. So we can go on. The next slide, please. Uh, committee adopted seven general comments. Uh, we talk about some very complex and important parts of the convention. Uh, we ask, uh, we try to give clarification, we try to give guidance, especially to the states, but also to all other stakeholders, how to best implement those. So in 2014, we adopted general comment number one on legal capacity, two on accessibility. In 2016, we adopted general comment number three on women and girls with disabilities and on right to inclusive education number four. Then general comment number five on article 19, living independently and being included in the community. And then last year we adopted general comment number six on article five, equality and non-discrimination, and number seven on consultation with persons with disabilities through their representative organizations and the role of national monitoring institutions. Uh, currently, committee should be working on general comment on Article 11, situations of risk. Also, we did have the <coughs> optional protocol uh, and uh, committee can review individual communications. It is important to that it's not a judicial review. Uh, so these uh, decisions are not mandatory, but committee relies on one of the basic fundamental principles of international public law that state parties have to implement their obligations in good faith. So far, I think around 25 or 28 individual communications have been reviewed and a number of EU member states have had reviews. For example, Sweden, we had a case of denial of reasonable accommodation when building permit was not given to build the swimming pool for purposes of uh, medical rehabilitation. Uh, then a blind applicant for the job was denied because it would be too costly to use specialized software. That was one where there was quite a split in the committee. We had six or seven dissenting views uh, from that one, so that was rather interesting. Then we had two that were are not admissible because legal remedies at national level haven't been exhausted. One was the case of uh, deportation of family with a child with autism. The other case was uh, individual who had a child with autism and wanted to apply one particular pedagogic method even though the uh, education ad agency advised against it. Uh, then we had two against Hungary. Uh, one was the case of a bankomat, the ATMs not being accessible to blind persons. Second one, I mentioned persons under guardianship were denied the right to vote. There were two cases against Austria too. One was a uh, lack of accessible information on the new tram line, line in one of the city for blind persons. The second one was very complex case of uh, making access to uh, a place where a person with disability was living, but it would involve building a ramp across the uh, 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 private property of a neighbor, and that was a very, very complex uh, issue. Uh, and then we had also a couple against Germany. Uh, one was involved where the employment agency did not support properly uh, applicant with disability to find a job. Then we had in Italy uh, apply applicant for a job, there was a quota uh, for employment, but there was only one place at the university uh, for a new teacher, and the individual who applied was with disability, but there were better candidates, so there was no violation of the convention. Uh, then we had also one against Lithuania, inappropriate uh, representation of a uh, person in court case, uh, lack of uh, access to justice. 
Uh, then we had also one against Denmark about the uh, family uh, reunion and the person uh, that was uh, receiving social uh, benefits and was not employed, so was not deemed capable of supporting his or her own family. Then uh, we had also, uh, I think, two recent cases against Spain uh, and one against Greece, but those happened after my time in committee, so uh, I don't really know the details. We all hold so head. Next slide, please. Yeah, and we had two in inquiries into grave systematic violations. One was against uh, Great Britain, which I talked about. The second one was against the Spain. Even though Spain does have very high level of students with disabilities in mainstream <coughs> schools, but since it's a federal country, different provinces and regions have their own legislation except in one of the regions in all the other regions uh, the law was sort of directing children with intellectual uh, impairments, more, especially more severe intellectual impairments and autism, into special schools. Even if it was hypothetically possible for them to go to regular school with supports, they would be uh, always sent to special schools. And the committee investigated that complaint and did uh, find that there was violation of Article 24, Right to Inclusive Education. So this is, these are some of the basic information. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And I will be, of course, looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much.